Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Ready Player Will here, JB79, episode 38 of the Leona Support. A couple weeks off, you know, I was on vacation last week, and we did the special live stream podcast the week before, so a little bit of a disruption to our normal cadence of stuff, but it's good to get back into the groove of things. 2024, here we are. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. It, it feels good to kind of get back in the seat again and, and uh, do the podcast. We had a good good break here over the winter, got to spend plenty of time with friends and family. Hopefully you got to do the same. And uh, yeah, excited for the new year, excited to uh, talk about the game again. How about you? Definitely. Same, yeah. Seven day vacation at Quebec City up in Canada and absolutely beautiful there. Low, like low temperatures, you know, 20s to teens, but we were dressed for it. It's just beautiful, like winter wonderland. And I come back here to Massachusetts and we get like eight inches, if not plus more, a foot of snow. And uh, I probably look exhausted just because, like, all the sh- shoveling I did yesterday. And, God, that's it, a lot of snow here. How are you doing with that? Oh, man. Yesterday, my my snowblower picked, like, the wrong time to break down. And uh, I've been shoveling all day yesterday. I was out there again this morning. I have a very big driveway. Uh, so, yeah, I feel like a sad old man today. The back is hurting. You know, I can barely move around. So. Dude, absolutely yeah. 10 billion percent. I was literally cutting potatoes to cook dinner. My forearms were killing me. I like, couldn't even cut potatoes. It was awful. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it uh, tells me that I need to get off the couch more and uh, hit the gym more. Yeah, uh, yeah. the uh, work from home is certainly uh, hindering me in that regard. Uh, but it's great for War of the Visions working from home. You know, get to do all this good stuff. But um, yeah, we got a bunch of topics today. Just a quick run through. We have a real quick PSA we're going to go through here with the Android crash where, uh, won't get into it now, but we're going to talk through that. We're going to talk about another issue that's been plaguing us. I know we don't want to start on a negative note, but these are things that uh, we want to bring some visibility to because they deserve it. We have a whole bunch of stuff to catch up on with Astrius, the timing of him, a whole discussion about him. We'll talk about the Vision card in Esper that's coming out this week. We also have the raid and the raid vision card and the new item coming out for that. We have very exciting Glex unit upgrades of 140s for some of our units we've been eagerly waiting for. Uh, MA2s, equipment upgrades, and then limit break upgrades. We'll go through those too, obviously. We're looking at equipment. We're not done yet. We're still going to go through the war room. We're going to look at some of the top 20 meta going on at the moment where, you know, it's been a couple of weeks just kind of see how things shook out after limited guild war. And then we aren't done yet. It's near automata to cover. We have Ashen Warrior Lucio, and we have some really fun Q&A stuff to get to at the end. So jam-packed night. But we'll start with some of the uh, game stability problems. And JB, I'll let you take the lead on that one. I, I, I kind of just wanted to throw this in here, just kind of talk about game stability right now. And this is like a, a Justin, if you're listening moment. Um, this this one, hopefully you are, uh, you know, because I, I wanted to kind of use this platform for a moment just to try to get some some eyes on this because as a community there's a number of players a lot of players i've been hearing about just really the game is crashing pretty much non-stop for them ever it's been a couple of weeks now basically i think maybe since the winter update this has been going on but essentially android users it's crashing all the time i've heard about people who can't get into the game now for for a couple of weeks and they maybe don't have an alternate method like the you know the PC clients and and emulators and things like that. So tell us what we need to get you guys. Like we can use this platform to get comments from the users, game IDs, descriptions of the platform uh, versions, etc. Justin, you can get in contact with us if you guys need that. Hopefully, this is going to be all for naught and it's going to be fixed after maintenance. You know that that's uh, my copium right now, but. Yep. You know, even if several people in our guild are, are experiencing this issue right now, uh, and I've been seeing people talking about it on Discord all over the place. So, uh, yeah, reach out to us. We can we can get you information to kind of fix it if needed. Uh, the the second thing is is another thing that that I personally have experienced. I'm sure you have as well. All the time. The, the UI lag when you're actually building a team within the game clients so easy to replicate. It happens no matter what version I'm on. If I'm on Google PC client, if I'm on my phone, if I'm on my Knox emulator, you know, whatever. Uh, this is happening to every veteran that I talk to. So I think that it maybe has some ties into having a built out account with many cards and basically, you know, most of the stuff in the game. I think that players that don't have as much, you know, stuff, uh, maybe it's not as noticeable or maybe it doesn't happen as much. But basically, it seems like there's some kind of memory leak where the game just slows down to a crawl when you start sort of building out your teams and formations uh, and, you know, you have to be doing it for several minutes before it happens, but 
Uh, it's very easy to reproduce. I could show you guys. You know, just let us know what you need because this has been going on for months now. It's, it's really, it's really getting annoying at this point. So, I'd like some comments from the teams, uh, you know, in game that they're looking at these things and because uh, they're pretty big issues right now, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. I mean, so yeah, and just circling back to the game crashing, that's that's been at least a couple of weeks, if not a month. And I know a lot of people have gone through the proper channels in terms of ticketing IT. They've gone through the uninstalls, reinstalls. I've seen people like tried like new phones and like rebooting their phone and rerouting it and things don't work and clearing the cache and uh, unfortunately out of options. And then, yeah, the UI issue for me in particular, it's, it's always a vision card related. The moment I go into my vision card stuff and start scrolling, the memory leak just occurs. And anytime I'm out of that, the game completely lags. Basically, I have to just restart every single time. And it does over time for the amount of time that we play it becomes very noticeable and definitely a, a pain in the butt. So would love both of those to finally get some extra traction on fixing because they are very much hampering some of the game optimization. At least some acknowledgement that you guys are aware of this issue and working on it. Obviously not expecting them to be fixed overnight, but you know, like I said, we're the offer is there. If you need our help to rally the community to get you guys info, definitely. Um, Reach out to us. Super easy, super easy. So yeah, well, on that note, we'll we'll actually talk about a couple of things in the game now, uh, namely Astrius, who came out last week and very much anticipated for many, many months. He was released initially as what seemed like a sort of answer to the soul ally combination. This seems like forever ago at this point to, to think about. So I haven't seen a soul in forever in top 20 um, that people were pairing the two of them together. He was kind of a happy medium of being able to mitigate both. And obviously we got a huge delay, so much so that the soul meta was basically over now by the time he came in helena is in the wrinkle of things and uh we finally get him and i know you and i have both been able to pull him on a banner that was very difficult to pull on that was not a friendly banner um but yeah uh what do, what do you think of your initial thoughts and impressions yeah so i will second very bad banner to start the year um not a not a good not a good for first foot forward here after like a really nice holiday season so <laughs> Aside from that, I do think he's a solid unit. I think that the meta has passed him by a little bit in terms of like his optimal usage, but I still think that he's very strong. I feel like he, at least at using him over the past week, he feels a little incomplete for me without his Esper and also like this sword option. I think that that Esper, like giving him that additional 10% uh, magic reduction actually makes a pretty tangible difference for him to kind of stack that up with what his courage does and, and all that stuff. Because honestly, there's been times where he just gets blown away by the Black Mages for me, and I'm like, I thought this guy was supposed to be a magic bruiser. What, what's he doing? But then, like, there's other times where, like, he also can completely dominate them. So it's it's almost like, you know, who's going to hit um, who first in a lot of those cases? Yeah, I, I do like him overall, though. I think that he's a strong unit. I do think he's actually a little bit better in Global 2 because of... Uh, the Esther situation and kind of her card and equipment as well. How about you? Absolutely. Yeah, he's um, it's a little inflated because of the map effects at the moment favoring lightning. So it is probably a little bit of a bias to how good he is. But I agree. I still think he's an exceptionally well-rounded unit. He's got so much versatility in terms of some of the different passives you can mix and match. Some of the toggles where he's got a couple different abilities he'd like to use. I think he can be a complicated character for most to get the most value out of, particularly because I do think he's a two buff unit that he needs that that second buff to get that courage off. If you somehow mix up your spacing and don't get that, the, he's demolished at that point. Um, but I, I do think out of all the slash oriented units we've gotten as of late, and just doing a quick recap, like Zidane was one of them. Halloween Lucy is technically one of them, so category of his own. But even before that, you get to Squall, you get to Grifford. Oh god, even before that, when Bart's obviously great. But I think out of all the slash units we kind of got as of late, there was a little bit of a lull there where we weren't very impressed. I do think he does relatively better. It's kind of hard to explain why, but his damage seems great. His utility is fantastic. He's a, a great unit that does a, both a blend of fantastic damage and fantastic utility. Um, I haven't played much with him outside of Mono Lightning yet, because I know Greatsword... Um, those teams can be kind of difficult. They got some deficiencies because they're very similar in how they operate in terms of like their inaccuracy, their brawler style play. They're usually locked to slash only. If you look at a lot of these greatsword users, most of them are limited to slash type attacks only. Only a couple have something outside the kit there. But I really do like him a lot. I, I didn't want to admit it because when he first came out, he seemed very much like a 
um, non-creative unit where I'm like, oh, they clearly just looked at Soul and Alaya and made a character who could do both. But he really does do more than that, and I need to give credit where credit's due. So yeah, big thumbs up. I I'm enjoying him. He's doing great things at the top end of the game right now in Guild War. I think that's a great sword. It is it's missing a couple of pieces for us. We've we've talked about it before with you know Bronwell and her card. I think are some nice pieces for the for, for that team. But overall, great sword is not one of the strongest groups. It hasn't gotten a ton of attention. A lot of the units within it, other than the you know the the couple most recent ones, are showing their age. Uh, the, the tank situation also, like with Joom right now, it's she's unusable in the magic meta, in my opinion. Yep. So I think Gridsword, I, I think that he's a building block and they're looking to maybe show Gridsword some attention this year. And I think we'll kind of see that unfold as we get into Nier and then probably, you know, over the coming months as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And and they're not far off. They have three different area res cards and three different agility cards. They have some good overlap in a couple of the cards between classes, between mace units um and even other slash oriented units the unit res card obviously is a big one to wait to come in here 2b was a an okay addition to it it, it was kind of redundant on what you seem to bring but yeah great sword teams particularly when you talk about like how they mix and match with some of the other classes i have found some difficult synergies where because they're there's not a lot of role compression in these characters where there's not a lot of them that have like a healing capability like soul or dagger did that you really do still have to like weave in a shells because you can't really run a bruiser team without the sustain and that greatsword team is difficult without the sustain like rain doesn't do enough damage to overpower enemies he's just a character to soak damage and you need to like sustain that so um the the pieces are like kind of there they just don't fit together if that makes sense I would like to kind of try him out with Soul. I, th I think that the Great Sword Devout angle is a, is a really good one. Absolutely. It's just that Soul also is struggling a little bit against the Black Mage team. Uh, that that magic, that, uh, you know, that the large area of effect magic damage really blows him up. So he's kind of biding his time at the moment. But I think, you know, we'll see a resurgence. And I, I think that the, the lightning fire combination there can be can be good with those two. I like it. But, well, you know, like you, like you we're talking about A2, obviously, with, with Nier. We'll talk a little bit more about her later, but that's going to be a good combo for him to kind of look forward to in the coming weeks as well. Yeah, I sure really should play test more of the Sol and Asterisk connection. The one thing that initially made me just kind of go, eh, maybe not, is I love Asterisk's AoE in peril. That's obviously one of the strongest things in his kit. And Sol is very much a unit res character only. It's really only in his limit break. That brings another AOE type of attack. So I didn't I didn't see Soul getting enough benefit from the AOE debuff um, to say like, yeah, he's the guy because they have some like non synergies between the two of them. But from a sustained perspective, in terms of like healing up Astrius, there's definitely something there. Obviously, when you consider too, like you can't defend both. You can't do area res and unit res and slash damage and magic damage. So there's there's some balance here that actually might have a uh, some legs. Definitely. Yeah, and I, I don't think the meta team has passed Astrius by. As you mentioned, it's a little inconsistent, but out of all the characters you can bring to the fight, he seems to be doing the best out of many of them. He's fine. He's one of the best units to bring. <laughs> that's, that's it. I, I mean, I, I do think that that Mono Lightning team is really strong, you know, with, with Raph and with Alaya. It covers a lot of bases. It's, uh, you know, you have a, a very strong sort of, you know, anti-magic unit with, with Raph. Uh Astrius is kind of in between. He's he's kind of pretty decent against both. And then Elia is just kind of your cannon, you know, damage dealer that can kind of come in and and kind of um, you know knock down the CT and then give that utility as well. It's, it's a pretty good team, and but I, I agree with what you were saying earlier. They are a little bit inflated by the map effects as as we've been seeing a lot lately. You know, it's, it seems like that's just what it is for <laughs> for regular Guild War. It's true. It's true. Flavor, flavor of the month kind of thing. Exactly. But at this point, we will look at the uh, Vision Card and Esper that are coming for him. It's the Heinler Great Dragon, uh, Vision Card and Esper. And we'll start here with the Vision Card. Now, I know we did a job-based Vision Card tier ranking a couple weeks ago. And this is one of our, I might have been, I don't remember the letter, but I think it was a D tier card. And uh, I'll, I'll give the quick low and dirty of it again. The, the attributes of this are a hefty amount of slash attack, 42 slash attack, 32 reaction block, 25 crit damage. The problem with this card is it's not one that's often in the main slot. So a lot of those stats are nerfed. And our best comparison at the time was really like the Sephiroth vision card where there's so many similarities with the reaction block with an amount of slash attack and just going off of that one in terms of how, you know what it did to shake some trees this one doesn't really do a whole lot either although 
there are a lot of characters on here that are pretty exceptional, but I really don't see this as anything more than just like some nice reaction block in a sub slot and a little bit of extra mods. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's. Uh, we'll have to see what the limited bestow is going to be on it for for Asterisk. Hopefully, it's for all of Lightning. That that would be that would be nice. I like it when it's a little bit more broad like that. Yep. So we'll we'll see what they do there. I don't think that you know even if it is ten AOE res or ten unit res or, or you know one of like the the more coveted uh, you know bestowed stats, I still don't think it moves into your primary. Um, although you know maybe you're just trying to blow up somebody. You know that's that's certainly something you can do. It's true. I just don't think it's often reliable. It's true. No, I agree. And and we've said this before too. The fact that it's limited to slash attack typically takes a backseat to the human killer type where it really only does apply to your slash oriented units. And so on the one hand, I like something like this for slash attack because once you start mixing teams outside of a mono element, they lose the the mastery abilities of like the element attack from teammates. So in order to like, let's say if you have two earth units and you take one of them out, you're going to lose 15 earth attack in that party. Well, you can kind of like replenish that modifier with something like the slash attack here. So it, it kind of net trades even, but I don't think it's enough to really define any way you build a team. It's just kind of a nice cherry on top. Yeah, I think with these cards, the ideal thing that you're striving for when you're mixing different jobs together is that all three of the party effects are usable by, you know, the, the, the main characters in your party. So if you're trying to mix Fist with one of these slashing jobs, you know, they're only benefiting from two out of the three. Still pretty nice. I mean, you know, crit damage, reaction block, pretty decent. Not enough probably to crack your primary, so... No, I agree. But they do make up for it, though, with the Esper, which is a fairly exceptional Esper here. Um, so then this is a permanent pool, by the way. So if you aren't pulling on it, that's fine. It will be around um, forever. So, you know, you're looking at a, a physical attack oriented Esper here. 17 agility already is a really good starting spot. That's one of the biggest numbers that people look for when they start with the Esper. Um, the, the build, though, the nodes here, the most important one, as you mentioned earlier, is that 10% all magic damage reduction, like this uh, no, set of nodes would be on near all the time, in my opinion, which also means you're getting the 35 reaction block rate, which for Astrius, uh, you can get them, I think, near 100% pretty decently easily, which uh, is actually really nice. There's a lot of counter abilities in the game that reduce slash damage. You know, like think of like Wrath, Reagan has one, um, that if you're able to have a near permanent, like 80% plus reaction block rate for those counters you can essentially maintain your damage up time without that counter ever proccing but even from the anti-magic perspective you're still getting what is it 15 percent magic if you really wanted to go that way a couple extra attacks certainly nice outside of that you know you can kind of go wherever you want with this in terms of crit rate or crit damage you can go with the earth resistance obviously where uh, you start here at the negative 10 you still have the nodes all things considered to to build the entire earth res tree here and be just fine so i, I think that's a good expert for that i don't know if there's anything else here that that you like about it in particular so i i like when these espers have the ability to go generalist so you know you can build into the crit damage and slash attack rather than the lightning attack you know for the uh, for the offensive side and then obviously you know defensively it's really lining up as like an anti-magic esper with a magic res and the magic flat reduction i like it a lot i think this is this is a really, really solid uh, Esper for a Bruiser. You know, somebody, especially for this meta that we're in, that's that's really heavy in its magic damage. And the good thing about this card, it's not a hollow card. It's it's going to be a 10k pull like yes. it used to be in the good old days. So, um, you know, you could take a flyer on it. We've we've gotten quite a bit of free viz lately with the with the New Year's login. So, I don't know. I just wish that the card was a little bit more useful. Absolutely, and we've seen that before, though, where one is usually a winner, one is a stinker. This is kind of that same situation. Very rarely do you get like an amazing Esper and an amazing Vision card. It certainly happens, but there's usually a, a trade-off in one or the other. But uh, yeah. So we have a, a raid coming out. It's been a little while since we've had a raid. And so there is a Vision card and a piece of equipment coming for it as well. We will, just on the topic of Vision cards, kind of maintain that, dis that discussion here. We'll talk about the Vision card first. And this is one that we actually kind of like i mean considering it's an mr vision card 18 percent area res is certainly still very competitive with what you'd like to see out of that stat 12 percent hp certainly is too and 30 percent attack because this is a main slot vision card so you know you're talking about that 30 percent attack oftentimes those attack numbers or attack percentages do get put in a sub slot so they end up being 25 percent instead well you basically this is like a free sub slot attack percent 
because it will likely be in a main slot for you. So I'm a big fan of just the, the numbers about this. So anything you like here from like a, a, a class perspective or like a element or character mix perspective? Well, ju- just on your point there, mm-hmm. the, I do really like this card. I think that even if you are using a group that has, a, you know, an, an area resist card, uh, oftentimes in the in my builds now, I am using an area resist card in the sub slot too. And, and a lot of times I'm turning to Death Machine or Winter Holiday Party. I would if if I have the option to in the, in the, in the team I'm using, I would use this over that. Um, it's only going to be like one percent less yep. area resist, I think. If that, it depends on on how the rounding goes. It might even be the same, to be honest with you. Um, but then you're picking up, you know, eight percent HP or so, and you're going to be picking up like you know fifteen to eighteen percent attack or, or some somewhere in that neighborhood. So uh, much superior, I think, to those old rainbow area resist cards. Uh, if you have the option to use it but you know i think you know axe book those are a couple of the groups that haven't gotten a ton of love this year that was one thing we looked at on on our last uh kind of christmas special there so so that's nice to kind of see some love for for those classes and yeah um obviously great sword is is uh, in the limelight right now with astrius so definitely uh i think the one thing too that i i most appreciate about this from a great sword perspective just circling back on that like bruiser topic of having some kind of sustain in your team what the one we already have um has the devout on it as we just mentioned this one having the staff black mage though there are some notable staff black mage supports where you look at someone like lemurae or lena or ayaka that when you wrinkle those like a different potential way to sustain your team i just like the doors that this opens book included where velas is in that group and who knows in the future you know that's a magic oriented class it wouldn't be a far cry to have another book unit in the future that might be a support oriented character so i just like the extra doors that this one opens in terms of that magic class overlap that uh you know great sword that's that's how you build a team like this is is having that versatility even just mixing asterius there with helena if you want to <laughs> That's right. the devil. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well said. Um, but the uh, raid item is unique. I'll, that's the word I got for this. So uh, this is one of those instances where I'm, I'm hesitant to no, trust the phrasing on Wood of Calc. Right now, if I'm, if I'm reading this proper or reading this correctly, it's upon a critical hit when your HP is above 60%. So there's two conditions. Now, this could be wrong because I feel like the crit hit only. I feel like we've seen this before where this was mistakenly put into a translation. Um, I don't know if that's the case here again. We have we have seen that before on the Blood Sword where it would have that, translated it as a critical hit. I'm not sure about this one. I feel like that would be... Awful. <laughs> yeah. It does have two effects here, though, because it's also giving you the, the additional healing power debuff on hit. That one doesn't say that it's crit based, so Correct. it'd be weird that the crit portion would be there, like with two, with one effect and not the other, if it was a mistake. Yeah, but um, and yeah, um, so this is a, it's ten healing power down, right, for on, on hit, which uh, I am not gonna lie, I think this is terrible. I think ten percent is is negligibly bad considering the amount of healing power you already get everywhere else. Like this, basically counteracts your trust on passive that that one will stack though with if you like we've seen with uh, lucio and and uh, melnia on their weapons i got you right for their attacks i got what you're saying yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. i got you i got you right so for for astrius who does have 40 healing power down this will make it 50 i agree that i'm sorry that's a good angle to take from it yeah it's all these like on hit effects will stack with whatever active debuffs and things which is uh can be a nice kind of niche for them I, I don't just, know. I'm not. I'm not in love with it. Yeah, it's not my favorite raid item, but I don't know. Maybe we'll find a use for it. Yeah, I. It's. It's. I don't know. Just statistically speaking, there's nothing up here either that really wows me in terms of of equipment stats, and the effects themselves is just one of those things. It's like, is this better than what you normally equip anyway? In terms of like an Alexandrite ring or a Genji glove, like probably not. That slash res pen is probably equal to the Genji glove damage, if you know what I mean. Um. Yeah, very niche. This is a, a tough raid item to think about. I mean, I, I think that it's kind of designed to work with Astrius because Absolutely. in J, in JP, he doesn't have a lot of you know slash res penetration. He just has twenty in his kit and no active buffs or anything to to, to boost it up. So, uh, obviously in global, that's a that's a big kind of value add that we have with Esther's card and her sword. 
Yes. He can pretty much ignore <laughs> he can pretty much ignore that entirely now if you use both of them. Exactly. So this item, you know, maybe on another unit it, it could uh, it could be interesting, but I wouldn't use it on Astrius. No, me neither. Me neither. Uh, but then on that note, we'll keep moving along here. Uh, we have the global exclusive units getting their 140 and MA2s. Um, Ibarra is most notably getting a change to her entire kit, similar to Summer Jaden did in terms of becoming the JP version of themselves. Oh, I'm sorry, fumbling here. Becoming the JP version of themselves. And we'll try to highlight this quickly here, but one of the big changes is uh, adjusting what her lightning imperil did, where it's now becoming a spirit imperil instead, if I'm recalling that off the top of my head correctly. So we'll kick things off here with the Ibarra upgrades, and they really are upgrades. People think it's an overall nerf. I don't I don't think so, but we'll talk through this. It's a good analysis piece. So currently, the big thing that to focus on is right now, her Wailing Storm is a 30% lightning imperil, and that is changing. So it's no longer a lightning imperil, but a spirit imperil. And it's technically getting an upgrade here where it's getting up to 35 instead of the 30. Nothing else about this particular ability is changing. Going from the lightning resist down to a spirit, it's kind of a downgrade. But oh, at the same okay. time, I think that this also opens up the door for her to be used differently. So lightning resist down, obviously that's good for her. It's good for a mono element team. Spirit down is now going to be better for her to be used in a job setup with other elements. It's more relevant to them. Uh, this one's also getting uh, an upgrade as part of her MA2. That's that's why you see the double upgrade there. It's getting a modifier increase going to 165. So it's it's a pretty nice skill. Uh, I think obviously, like I said, for a lightning team, it's a it's a downgrade. She does still have a lightning apparel though on her LB, although it is single target. But I think I remember looking at it before, like you know when you look at maybe mixing Skahal with Abara. He obviously also already has Thundaga Disposer, yep. and Wailing Storm at that point was very redundant. It's like, you know, why are you going to use these two together? Well, for that particular team and a Lightning Magic team, that now is a much better combination. So uh, I do actually like it at the end of the day. I think it's nice. I love that you brought that up because I remember there was a time where almost every Lightning unit seemed to have a Lightning Apparel on it, where I think even Lightning from 13, I think, has a Lightning Apparel. I am fairly... Charlotte obviously does. It's her big single target, like close ability um and if i recall Alaya. 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 right so there's so many characters that have the lightning apparel it became very redundant in terms of like extra utility to bring to the team so from like a fitting a, her into a team together yes objectively speaking it's a nerf but i like the upgrade i think it's overall a a net value add at this stage in the game and the other big upgrade here is a massive one is her buff her self buff so formerly magic attack 25 the magic res pen of 40 and human killer at 25 that's getting a substantial upgrade here. We're also getting 20 AOE res. And again, some of this is the MA2, but you're also getting the uh, physical damage barrier of 7,500 HP, which is a very, very big you know, piece of survivability. We've seen how helpful these barriers are. They can get broken, obviously, but otherwise speaking, very, very helpful. I love that upgrade. This is an, this is an incredible buff. Like it was, it was already like when this came out and it had like, you know, three different nice offensive effects on there. I remember at the time being blown away by it. Obviously, nowadays, just the three offensive effects, it's still okay. It doesn't look quite as nice. But now adding two, like, primo defensive effects in there with the barrier and 20 AoE res, phenomenal, phenomenal, uh, you know, self-buff there. Absolutely. Because if I recall, the big thing used to be you'd run the Paladin, and you'd have her use the physical damage shield here instead, which you no longer are forced to, which I think is a really nice value add that you can instead lean on maybe something in the Blade Solar. I don't know if you'd ever use Demon S, but... Maybe no that <laughs> that one's kind of weird. I mean, it has like the weird transposition skill and like an AP recovery. Yeah. Um, the only skill that you might consider running Paladin for now is the Saintly Healing, which was kind of hit or miss. Like if she would use it, you know. Yes. But still, so, yeah, I've seen her use it though. Guild War second fights if she's low health, that's a viable skill. So yeah, I do like um, you know, Blade Soul obviously still has some value there with the slashing and the dispel attack and and things like that. The problem with Blade Soul for her though is that a lot of like a lot of the utility there is relying on her critting, which she, she was never like an exceptional crit unit, and I don't think that is is uh, is going to be changing. No, I agree. At least her vision card though is still the thirty five percent dexterity, which if I remember, I I I had the same thought because innately she is not a high crit rate unit, 
But I recall if you actually build out that team, have that vision card and a couple other things, the actual net effect of the crit rate was much higher than I my gut thought was. So I agree with you. It's still very difficult to like work around this, but I remember being surprised. So I'd have to re-examine that. Yeah. And the final one here is the 120 ability is getting Dispel, Protect, and Shell on this AoE, which obviously is huge for uh, not only the Shell Dispel for herself, but Protect removal for teammates. So overall, just a, a really fantastic upgrade for this unit. Um, it does everything. It adds uh, the bulk that you want. It adds some extra offensive utility here. It adds some extra damage from the higher imperil, technically. Um, a lot of good things. And I'm, I'm going to be, I, I agree. I, I think that, that uh, she's a big winner here. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that all the numbers here, you know, based on the descriptions are going to be identical to JP. That That's why we pulled them up here. And I'm also going to guess that her, her Dream Awakening and MA2 are going to follow suit and be identical. We, we could take a quick look at those two here. Yeah, definitely can. So it's a, an extra AoE res of 15, the magic of 20%, and that Dream Ability upgrade was that, we, what we just Wailing covered, Storm. the Wailing Storm upgrade to 35%. So uh, yeah, the AoE res is certainly nice because she's got none of it otherwise. So not only is she getting the 15 from that 140, but the extra 20 from this buff. All things considered, that's pretty good for the modern state of the game. Yeah, she already had 10, so she's oh, got 25 thank you. plus yep. the 20. Yep. Her card is a 20, so she's very easily going to be 65 there with her buff. She's getting the 20% HP as well from from her uh, from her MA2. Pretty pretty solid upgrade here. I'm, I'm, my interest is peaked with this unit. I think that she'll see some play. I agree. I agree. And then the three other units are Esther, Sylvie, and Shadow Links. Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit in the past before about some of the potential upgrades we'd like. I don't remember what they are, unfortunately. But uh, but I know, we'll start with Esther. Do you have anything that comes to mind when you think of like what you'd like to see for her? I know one of the big things that we said before is that this unit had such a heavy magic resistance penalty coming in. We wanted to see that shored up in some way or eliminated. She is absolutely unplayable like in the current if you think about trying to slot her in against like this black mage team like yeah she's she, like yeah just toast uh i would i would like her to see get, see her get maybe some of the modern buffs that we've seen like maybe the the physical magic reduction angle like soul has i think that that could be a nice self buff and an upgrade for her Aside from that, you know, I think that, you know, her damage is okay. Like, her penetrations are there. Like, her speed is, has always been okay. She's got the agility uh, passive that she can throw on there. Accuracy, you know, similar to Astrius and a lot of other lightning units. I feel like that's just one of the hallmarks for the elements, so I'm not sure they're going to do much about that, but that's certainly always been a, a big concern for her. Um, but I think that the kit, you know, is still pretty pretty decent. Her her main survivability was was her physical barrier. 50%, maybe they could upgrade that maybe to a 70% or, you know, something like that, maybe even an HP barrier. I don't know. I, th I think that um, the bones are here that I think that she could still be a competitive unit, like if we're in a physical meta. Yeah, well, I, well, I kind of have to see what they um, what they, what they they do with it. What, uh, what, are, what are your ideas? So it's tough because she was always a, like, bruiser slash oriented unit, and I think Lightning has too many of them at the moment, that uh, Astros being one, Squall, famously kind of the other one, um, obviously, there's Vega kind of in his own right, like in the right situation is is definitely bulkier than most. So I actually don't know the direction I want to go in because I feel like there's already a bunch of copies of her that exist. So I, I don't want to like be pessimistic about this, but I would like to probably just see her as a specialist of sorts that one of her secondary buffs here is the Pierce Strike and Missile Res. If you just like lean into that, I know typically they upgrade their main priority buffs, which is their teammate one, which is the physical barrier in that case maybe go for i don't know like a, a 25 percent area reduction like the uh like we see with the modern units but other than that i wouldn't mind seeing her just relegated to a specialist unit where there really is some redundancy already with the rest of it that if you're going to try to make her unique and not just a generic lightning bruiser it would be kind of fun to see her get that pierce missile and strike res to kind of like just have that niche or even like amp it up you know similar like soul had like the 35 percent you know uh strike resistance right maybe maybe those get bumped up to like 30 35 percent exactly or for lightning allies or for gray sword allies or however they want to do it um that would, that would be kind of cool too yeah definitely and how about sylvie that was an interesting unit that uh she's not that far off from still being a, a good unit uh what would you like to see for her 
I've, I've seen this thrown around and it's something that I agree with. I think that it would be really strong for her to get like the, the double use of her limit burst. Like mm. they, we've seen on a couple other units in the game, Kill Fae, Ayaka. That would be, that would be pretty huge for her, I think. Uh, it, it would also be very, very strong on, on the other hand. So maybe, maybe it's too strong. I'm not sure. I, I've always wanted more use out of her job 25 as well. It, yes. It's something that I had a lot of high hopes for when I first looked at the kit. But in practice, it wasn't something that she really ever used in kind of maybe trying to pair her up with with uh, units that have very high defense. And then you think about like one of her main buffs is also kind of bumping up your defense quite substantially too. So I feel like she was always meant to kind of, you know, debuff that onto the enemies and kind of increase the team's survivability, but it just never really panned out. She she really always uh, tended to go for the the re-raise dispel just because it was a more liberal um, area of effect. We used to turn this off to be honest. True, true paladin strike it wasn't even worth putting on when you consider the value of a re-raise remove. It just completely exceeds what this ability did. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe they could even add on some another effect to it. Maybe they could increase it to like a forty defense penetration or a fifty to make it more substantial. Um, but yeah, I would like to see that overall be better. I honestly, my favorite, I love the double limit break idea for the true paladin strike. Oh. I'll just share it just so people can, can see this. I don't know why we're not sharing in the meantime. <laughs> um, the, it's a decreased defense pen of 30 for three turns. We've seen this is okay, but I'd really like her to get the winter wrath upgrade here where it's like a physical damage debuff, like 25% less Ooh. bright where wrath has that specialty of like anti-magic and maybe it's overkill to do both like slash res pen reduction and physical damage reduction because you can kind of cover both in one. But if you just said physical damage reduction to 25% to enemies, like I think it's pretty balanced, particularly considering it's only a cross shape, not a giant diamond. So uh, I like that. I think that would have, I have some, some legs. Or they could add the spirit penetration 30 on there as well, because that would be synergistic with her resolute oaths buff. If maybe they were upgrading that, um, I know that that buff was often also disabled because she would kind of spam that around, but if that was increased to more spirit and defense and maybe some other effects to to make to make it uh, more worthwhile, then I think that could be pretty uh, pretty nice too. I agree, absolutely. And then Shadow Links, which, God, where do you even start? Uh, I, I know for me personally, I've talked about this to death, the big L for me on Shadow Links is that her main diamond ability is, is putridly bad. Ending Axel is horrendously bad. That it's this nice, generous diamond. The only utility on it is that you gain AP when you kill someone, and it's not even a particularly high mod. Um, nothing about her kit really has, has any damage amplification. There's so much you would need to do to this unit, and I know, again, if you're just going off like what they typically do for upgrades, um, obviously they need to add something to her buff here. I'm not even going to stipulate as to what, because there could be a whole bunch of ways you could go with it. A perfect launch being that 120 upgrade, what else could you add to that too? I would like to see this have a, a courage remove or a re-raise remove on it or something that's more than just 100% hit chance. Really make that the the power option. Um, but yeah, there's a lot that this unit still needs. I don't think she's that far off, even though I'm saying there's a lot. There's a, as far as pierce units go, like you could make it work. There's still some you know some stuff there. I agree. And ending Axel, I think should. That's what I would actually like to see, like the courage removal on. Like oh. that would be like a marquee, have a diamond courage removal. Um, and then it kind of fits with the name ending Axel. Are you oh, really gonna it's great. end somebody? <laughs> Get, I, I changed my mind. I'm going with that. I love it. Perfect launch should have some kind of dispel attached to it. Hmm. Maybe I don't know, like maybe a regular dispel. Maybe they could try to lean more into that hate dispel mechanic. Maybe, I, I maybe love they it. could give that to her. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that they're just like with the other GL units. This is a hundred cost unit. Like she has some good components to her. Her self buff is still pretty nice. The thirty area resist. They were really trying to build like the AP management with her with with that self buff and then the ending axle. But it's really kind of whatever compared to what you know the units are getting nowadays for AP management. So. Yeah I, yeah, I think she needs a couple of really, really strong upgrades, like we mentioned, for it for it to really pop. Totally. Which, I, I, I've seen a reason why they couldn't. I certainly think they could. But then, uh, just on top I of... Have, oh, go ahead. Before we move on, though, I, I was actually surprised to see that there was no announcement about these units becoming permapool. 
which is which is kind of odd to me and, and kind of like you know why are we still kind of holding these back on these limited banners are they maybe they have some hopes to like get a last rush of money here with some nice upgrades and then add them into the pool later like at an anniversary and, and give them to jp i don't know but I, I was a little bit um surprised to see that and it does give me some hopes that the upgrades will be nice because they because of that they they want to um, still maybe make some money off of them i like it I'll, hopefully that's the case i'm definitely a fan of that that's a good good theory around it but uh yeah we also have some limit break upgrades and a couple characters we'll go through them quickly here at least some of the ones that were kind of whatever uh L regular luartha is getting a, a, a ap reduction cost it's a break physical barrier on that limit break and a 100 percent reduced counter before the damage it's also a decrease of chain res of, of 50 post that damage not enough for her that limit break is is very short range if i recall as well so nothing good about that upgrade for if anything it should be a range extension on the ability um but yeah this ability is purely them leaning into the pve potential mm -hmm. luartha has always been like if a really nice guild raid unit yep. with the you know quad shot and often she would lead off the fight with the with this ability for the agility uh, debuff so now it's it's also going to add in there that chain resistance so that kind of being put on early in the fight does actually make a, i have done some testing on that it does actually help your chain damage and improve you capping out earlier so it does help her niche there otherwise total garbage <laughs> pvp yep. it's it's nothing it's this nothing. is whatever yep and then uh glaciella the the water unit glaciella is getting her limit break upgrade here and this, is a, a this unit, is a good one it is a good one it's a unit who her regular main job it just doesn't seem to fit as well anymore and so it's tough to really get that uptime value but um, it's, she's maintaining the, the combo chain of, of uh, whatever that ability, if you will. But it's a Dispel Courage, Dispel Re-Raise, so it's both. Now, again, very short range, so you're not getting a giant area of effect. It's really on one unit to guarantee the removal of either or both, which there are many units that do have both. I, I think of, like, regular Wind Flag Barrier Glass Yellow. She'll often have Courage on her Limit Break and get Re-Raised from Sidali or Lena. This would do both. Um, certainly awesome. The extra thing here is the 70% chance is... Probably the highest we've ever seen in the game. Yeah, that's you're not going to dodge that one. Nope. And then uh, reduce the damage taken by 50%. Uh, that's all damage, so it's a nice general barrier. Uh, and then the AP restore of 10%. So this is a, you know, the, the thing about this ability that's nice too is that because of how short range it is, by the time you're using it in the fight, you probably are spent for your AP. So you, this is an opportunity to get some back. And then the survivability, I love because that's part of her problem with the leaping strike ability is that it often put her into weird positions and situations where she would suddenly be on the front line or in the midst of damage and just couldn't live and it's at least a something to try to address that it's a great limit break upgrade one of the one of the better ones we've seen it's also getting a huge cost reduction to 24 ap only so yeah i think they, they they have like you said they specifically have designed her to jump in with the leaping strike she gets the 40 percent ap reduction as part of that skills buff then she can immediately use this the next turn. It can actually hit multiple units if they're you know both in a line. Yep, it is pier piercing. So and then she'll get the she'll get the barrier there to help her survivability, and she'll get the door to kind of sustain her. Right. Really, really good. That that's um, like I said, one of the, one of the better ones we've seen. Yeah, not always do they nail the conceptual piece of things there, but uh, we'll see if they do the same for Oberyn, who does need a lot of help. He is, uh, does not feel like the 100 class unit he used to be. And his limit break upgrade here, the big thing is um, the extra physical damage increase. That's certainly nice, 20%. But it's only when your HP is under 50%. Um, I don't love Correct. that. I don't love that piece of it. Um, he's not that bulky that he'll be below 50% for long. Um, but it also gives himself haste. That's obviously enormous. Um, also gives him 25 unit res. When your HP is a, above 50%, which again, I don't love the conditional effect. And the HP increase of 30% is okay. But like 30% isn't game changing. This one, I like that it's going to a diamond. That's a very nice upgrade where it was formerly just a crotch shape. So you go for a much larger area. Nice AP reduction, obviously going to 34. I wish there weren't as many conditional effects on it, but it's okay. So the, the way that I read this is that it's like an either or um upgrade if he's kind of going in and he's taking a hit on his way in and he's he's below that 50 percent 
it's really going to amp up the damage potential of this. He's going to get the pre-damage, you know, 20%, kind of almost like a revenge ability. However, if he's kind of leading off the fight with this and he's still, you know, topped up, he's going to he's going to get the haste and then he's going to get those defensive effects. I don't hate it. Um, especially with the range increase that this is getting. He's got the total range of six there. He's going to be able to hit more units. More likely he's going to be able to hit two or even three units on your team. Get that in peril there. I don't know. I, I hoped for a little bit better, but I don't think it's a bad one. It's not a, not a bad one. I just have concerns with the amount of variability that's in it. That if it's that, most of the breaks are not this variable. You know exactly what you're getting. The fact that this one could be good, could be bad. The timing could work in your favor. Maybe it's not. The amount of RNG that's kind of built into it uh, makes me hesitant to really give it a two thumbs up, but... It's not, it's not bad. It's definitely obviously better than what it was before from, from at least the diamond alone. That alone is an enormous upgrade for it. Yeah, I mean, it, it still hits for a lot of damage with the with the Imperil on there. Absolutely. And I, I have always liked I, I have always liked this limit burst for the job potential, whereas it's it's imperiling multiple elements there. Yep. Uh, it does also stack with just standard element down. Like if somebody then throws Earth Res down, it does stack. So I don't know. I, I have some hopes to try him out again after this comes through. I'm, I'm going to at least play around with it in the spear team and see how it looks, but I, I don't have like enormous hopes for it. <laughs> no, same. I, and I've been doing the same because I've been looking for ways to min max my young eld. And with as much lightning running around as there is, this kind of that copium where I'm like, if I only had a good earth unit to put next to him, it would at least like maybe counterbalance it a little bit. And Oberyn hasn't been that guy. I'm not saying the limit break will make him that guy, but it. It's something. It's not going to hurt. Yeah, definitely not. But uh, we do have one final one here. It's the Fryevia, uh Limit Break announced. And we don't have any confirmation of what it is, right? We No, we have no idea what it's going to yeah. be. Yeah. So what would you like to see if they were to give her that Limit Break? My my ultimate copium for Fryevia is that she is going to debut the 40% Magic Resistance Aura. Yes. And she would need a range increase on on the limit burst for that, I think, as well, kind of to go along with it. My, my, I'm just not sure if it's going to happen though, because I feel like that's like a big money maker for them to sell on a brand new unit, and, and not to give it on this old eighty cost unit. So I really, you know, don't believe that's going to happen. On the other hand, maybe it could give her some. Maybe this could give her like that thirty five percent physical magic reduction. Uh, buff like Helena and Soul get, um, like the AOE res mitigation or whatever. That could be kind of nice as one effect, and then it does something else for. Um, I don't know what what uh, ideas do you have? I have I have one that I feel very confident. I would love to see this for. So number one, right now the the hate on her unit is not innate. There is hate innate on her vision card, which you can give her, but otherwise her hate is relegated to her buff which is the attract barrier that's fine that's great i would love for this similar i think engelbert got the upgrade where they gave him hate on the limit break i would love a secondary effect of adding hate to this but number two i was really playing off the name of this ice prison this ability has nothing to do i think with the name i would love for this to get a 67 percent chance to immobilize where if you were in a fight it's a kind of ability, and then you give her some kind of defensive buff. Maybe it's the 35% reduction that you're talking about. Maybe it's a barrier. Maybe it's a mirage. You know, who knows what it is? A mirage for a turn. But I would love for this to be able to immobilize in a small AoE. It's not a diamond. It's a small cross. Relatively short range. So it's not like a crazy nuke from afar. Immobilize the enemies. Give her some extra hate if it's already worn off or been dispelled. Mid-fight. Um, give her some bulk with it. I think overall that would help her do the job uh, a lot better in terms of the tanking. Maybe like give her some kind of a heal as well, so that maybe you don't feel yes locked into going into the white mage. Yes, maybe that that could be um, nice. I do like I do like the immobilize idea though, uh, especially if they were to make it a diamond, and you could maybe immobilize the whole team. That would kind of enhance her value maybe with uh, with missile units. Yep, where if they're all locked in place, they're gonna not gonna be able to line up those AOE AOEs onto your uh, range units. Yep. Oh, there's there's so much they could do. I mean, this you know, this unit needs some love. Hopefully, hopefully she gets it. She's certainly a fan favorite. Absolutely is, absolutely is. But 
yeah, that's what we're getting for limit break upgrades. We do have a couple, and you know, I know we're getting long here, but we'll try to go through some of the rest of these topics here. The Reliquary's equipment, we'll go over them briefly. They're uh, they're not great, unfortunately. At least one of them is not. One of them is the death penalty weapon. Real quickly here, it's getting an upgrade where you'll get a 20% damage buff, physical and magic, after you kill an enemy. Um, little conditional. Otherwise, outside of that, it's 20 missile attack and 20 crit damage. Not our favorite. The, the attack buff, particularly, I mentioned this earlier when we were pre-talking, but like, when you consider the missile matchup versus tanks in terms of how long it takes them to kill someone like that, I just don't think there's a lot of early fight upside for this that I don't think it really gets any benefit. I agree. I mean, we were, we were talking a little bit before about this, and we both agreed that we would like it more if if it was the 10% increase in magic and physical like most of the other Reliquary's weapons without the condition rather than like the enhanced 20% with the condition. Um, yeah, it's a bad. I condition. agree that because I mean one of one of the problems oftentimes we find with the missile units is the tank busting and, and really getting through the tank quickly. This really doesn't help that out much at all. Even non tanks, the amount of unit res in the game and just the interactions, the missile damage. When's the last time a missile unit like blew you away? Like it, it just, they just don't have the killing power. So the fact that they tie this to killing power, not a good philosophical matchup. But the other one is a sword that remains to be untranslated here. I don't know what the name of it is. Uh, say, oh, save, save the queen. The queen. Uh, this is a, a f physical damage 20% uh, reduction of all physical damage, but it's removed after two hits. Still very strong for the ramp up of that. The AP consumption reduction, really great. And the slash attack, I can see this on a lot of good tanks. So yeah, it's like a free 20% barrier for two hits. Obviously not breakable at all. It's innate. And then the 20% AP consumption also... Pretty nice. I think that this one was also a kind of kind of uh, designed a little bit around Astrius and maybe leaning a bit more into his physical bruiser side. He does have that innate fifty percent barrier that comes with his passive, and this obviously that's going to stack right on top of it. Gets him to the the seventy percent threshold for two hits. So yep, pre pretty strong. I, I wouldn't use it right now in the meta, but if you're starting to see more physical, you know. Um, opponents and, and you're using him for to that purpose pretty nice uh, same thing for Joom or, or you could even use this on rain to kind of shore up his physical um, um you know deficiencies so yep yeah pretty well, pretty nice one of the first things i thought of so we'll pause real quick here just to talk a little bit about the meta ships because it's been like a month since you know we had limited guild war for a while and now we've missed out in a couple weeks and so we have a new guild war map as well and uh, howell has just reached rank number five this week. I, it's the highest I can remember seeing them uh, off the top of my head. We've never been, we have yeah. never been that high. So, so five yeah. we, uh, promoted into the Gemini. We've been playing against Asura Vision and uh, and Veritas and Final Boss and all them. It's been very interesting considering the uh, Lightning meta where it is Astrius, Winter Wrath, and a lot of people at the top end pulled for Astrius. Um, it was particularly Final Boss did, which we were... Um, Impressed by, I don't know what the adjective you want to use is, <laughs> but uh, everyone's still using VV Helena pretty regularly. Raph is still very popular. There's a ton of offensive variety. Though. I've seen so many offensive teams. The walls are a little whatever, but yeah. What do you think about this map in the meta so far? Top twenty. I think people have been searching for for the answer to to that Black Mage team. There, there have been some some ones that we've come across. Uh, I think that. Having that across your whole guilds to deal with, like the full, you know, the the whole wall of of, of black mages, is the, the challenge, and kind of having, um, you know, the, all those uh, necessary pieces. But I think that some people are now shifting into lightning, and kind of, you know, that obviously is one of the answers with with Raph coming in recently at Christmas. Now Astrius, now you have two very strong magic bruisers. And, you know, Eli is that third piece that can kind of kill the re-raise if, if you can get her in a position to do it. But I think we're going to be seeing that Black Mage team, even despite that, I think we're going to be seeing it for a while. It's going to be in the rotation, you know, even if it, you know, gets dropped from being the top team, it's still going to be around. And then, you know, once you get outside of the top 10, Dark and Light have traditionally always been the favorite plays of the player base. Yep. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> probably be seeing it even longer there. I would agree with that. It's the kind of thing where a lot of people are able to beat this team nowadays, but the moment you take your foot off the pedal, they come right back and just reminds you just why they're that good. Um, because it's not undefeatable. Um, we have found iterations that work, but it's it's kind of all or nothing. You can't kind of go halfway against that team. 
particularly because there's so many iterations where maybe Helena gets the barrier, maybe Vivi's on double haste, uh, Raph maybe has the jump, maybe she doesn't, maybe there's a bow tie in there somewhere. Uh, there's so many different iterations of how you can make that work that no one team is, is really the same. They all kind of, you can make that team do different things every time. I think even if you do have a nice team that can reliably beat it, you still come across those times where things just line up perfectly in the turn rotation for them. Or, you know, maybe you don't, maybe you aren't able to resist the stun, you know, stuff like that, where it just completely turns the tide. You know, maybe Helena gets the perfect heal onto everybody. Yep. Uh, and then, you know, your magic da damage dealer comes up and gets reflected on the very next turn. Stuff like that happens, you know, even if you have a great team um, and you still lose. So exactly, it, it is a very, very strong and, and difficult team to face. I'm just going to pop in and look at offense real quick. And yeah, offense you can see is is definitely more lightning heavy far more variety you're seeing even uh, a wind in here you're seeing no wind on defense um a addison is still on offense here there's there's definitely more offensive versatility and i think if you were to expand this even further to say like 12 units you got shoot you yeah shells is in there um i think shells is in the bottom too to be honest but there's definitely um a different distribution of offense versus defense so yeah and i mean that makes sense because uh, you know um, you, you, we are seeing like some earth being used on attack as well for that evasion play that they've been trying to abuse some of the, the accuracy deficiencies, not seeing it as much on the, on the defensive side, but you know, maybe that is going to change here now with, with all the lightning attackers being used. Uh, we, we have actually seen, uh, Ashura w was actually using, uh, earth recently. So they were, uh, they were, and if they weren't using earth evade right now, they certainly might be using them soon with 2p because we'll talk about the near automata um collab that's coming out where we have upgrades to both 9s and 2b they have a2 coming out they have 2p coming out who is a earth i won't call her an evade unit but like she's kind of an evade oriented unit um i know for me i have not done the deep dive on a2 and 2p that i normally do yet i haven't looked at their stats as much i've looked at the kits the kits are great um stat wise I mean, this is a gotcha game. There's, they're probably not that bad stat-wise. Like, I, I'm expecting good things. A2's got a nice anti-pierce niche, which rip uh, Pierce never even had a chance, if uh, if that's the case. <laughs> um, the 9, uh, 9S upgrades are great. 2Bs I'm not a big fan of. But yeah, anything about the Nier collab so far you're looking forward to or, or want to highlight? I absolutely love Nier. Like, that that game is like a top all-time game for me. Uh, the music is, is top all-time as well. It's it's just a phenomenal all-around package. Cool story, cool characters. So I have, I'm ecstatic that it's coming back. We've I think a lot of us have been waiting for it and hoping for it to come back. It's finally here. They were, you know, some of the only units that um, haven't been able to get to 140 yet, uh, other than a couple of collabs and and tactics. Yes. God, God. please. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that. Um, I, I agree. I, I like 9S's upgrades a little bit more than 2B's, although the main thing that 2B is getting is is that, you know, she is going to be getting a way to get the guaranteed hit ignore on her limit burst. Yep. Pretty cool, but she has to be able to use it first. <laughs> so, yep. Um, A2, and again, we're going to keep this very surface level because, you know, these units are going to be coming to us here within a couple of weeks. So we'll go more in depth on them then, but a2 looks very strong. She's been used quite a lot in JP. Obviously, you got the ice water connection. That's that's very nice. And yeah, like you said, rip spear team that we've all been trying to make work that doesn't quite work. <laughs> God. Uh, so yeah, we're, yeah, we'll probably still be waiting on that for a while. Yep. Two P I think looks good though. I think, I think it's like finally a strong ninety cost. We we really haven't seen that many ninety cost units that are they're really kind of worth that that investment. She seems like that. Um, she could be. She's got some nice abilities. Absolutely great Earth unit. She works so well with that Earth team, um, and others. I've seen her used in a couple other teams too. But yeah, we'll definitely do a, a deeper dive as they get closer because we also have Ashton Warrior Lucio, who kind of the same thing. I've not done the proper deep dive that I want to. He's very popular in JP right now, pulled by many of the top guilds. I know his limit break is kind of like a, a mini stag impact of Alaya. That you know, it's not the same spammable on demand that hers has, but. Still a very powerful ability. He seems to be a very, very good unit so far, though, and, and definitely looking forward to diving deeper on him, too. He, he seems like very s similar to the um, Astrius vein in that he's just a very solid all-around bruiser. Like, he's, he's good damage. 
And he's very stout against pretty much any kind of damage or elements. You know, he's got, I've seen builds where he's at 30 to 40% all element resistance. Pretty crazy. So I think kind of like maybe the light version of Sephiroth in a way as, as well. Yeah. That's so, a... Yeah. Looking forward to kind of seeing him as well. Yeah. Definitely a good comparison. But yeah, we wanted to kind of move along here because, again, we're going to revisit these in a couple of weeks, give them the love and attention they deserve. But we have some good Q&A here where we do still want to get through some of these and, and have a chance to talk through these. So, so we have two, uh, four total questions here uh, submitted by, uh, I think, most of them by Brad Strong Earth, who is a... Uh, uh, definitely an active member of the Discord. Definitely, a, I consider him a friend. I, I enjoy his uh, approach to the game. Uh, he's in uh, Veritas. No, he's in Chocoboss. He's in Chocoboss. Um, yeah. Who, uh, yeah, but his question first here, are what are the, the top three most misunderstood, misused, underused, underestimated units in the game for autoplay in particular? I know for me, it's the, it's the units that, if I'm going off of how we build in the top 10, it's units that are very bow tie heavy. To get their most utilization and there are a couple units that are night and day whether or not you have bow tie and immediately come to mind sadali is one of them queen mashari is another one and dark fino is the third and a part of the reason is because a they're not as squishy as they should be to frontline where a lot of them can get blown up pretty easily but a lot of them have some curative potential with like let's say like devout sub jobs or even Mashri with the Arithmetician with the healing capabilities, that by allowing them to stagger behind a little more, you get a little more of that road compression where they're normally DPS-oriented AI, where they'll walk forward all the time and always attack if given the priority. And the staggering of that bow tie not only, A, obviously does like things for buff potential in terms of your teammates, but more than anything, it allows for some better spacing to really allow them to, A, survive longer, and B, get some extra role and utility in there for a variety of, of Guild War fights. And so I think those three units uh, quite often don't get the same upside when they're not played with that bow tie, which obviously is a difficult accessory to, to wrinkle in for some when you have to think a little bit deeper about things. But it's night and day when you talk about the influence of those characters when you use that item on them, that I think it's probably under that category of like misused, misunderstood, underestimated, just because people are, are not using with that variation of the bow tie that we've really been able to like far exceed their ceiling of what they're normally capable of. To be honest, I, I've, I mean, not with the bow tie specifically, but using Vivi in that method, I think is the best way to use him as well. And it's more how you kind of tune his AI and his placement to take advantage of his buffs that kind of do that naturally. Yep. And kind of having him sit back and then come in late in the fight to get off like the key stun or get off the key AOE. And then you're just toast because right. you know you lose the whole turn. So that that I think I've I've, I've noticed in, in kind of fighting him, that seems to be the best way for him as well. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit on the manual side because you know I, th I think you, you know you mentioned some good ones for auto PvP. Uh, it's not going to be any surprise to any like manual players out there, but maybe to some auto folks, this one will be surprising. But I will give some some kudos to my man Lorenzo. The mm. old MR Earth Spear unit. He, for a while now, has been a staple in manual PvP. Because obviously when you're talking about like class match and things like that, you're talking cost limited. You know, you need a low cost unit in there that's going to give you some value. He gives you uh, something interesting in that he has the Time Mage sub job. Uh, so he can throw out some weird transposition plays where he can you know, cast the, the transposition, you know, move and, and then other units so they can get more movement. He can give you the haste play from the, from the you know, the time mage. And he's also a plate wearer, so he's got keen blade as well. Yes. You can throw that on. He's an extremely accurate unit for an MR. Uh, he's better than most URs in the game because he has, like, some nice buffs and things. He's got a, an AOE barrier break. He's got the, you know, protect shell, re-raise, and courage removal with his uh, Dive of Destruction. Super, super good unit, um, specifically for, for manual. Though I think, you know, he can actually be decent in auto as well, you know, it's, uh, you know, limited moments. I'll confirm that he can. We did a tier list together and you brought up Lorenzo and really hard on like pumping him up there and I was kind of skeptical. And I used him in auto like that week after and it was some kind of cost limited thing. And yeah, very impressed. I'm now kicking myself that I didn't even think of him in the WDL to try to draft him early. God, what was I thinking? Um, but yes, yes, that's a good good choice there. Definitely a favorite. 
So this second question comes from, uh, I think it was Thunder Mage. Basically an idea to say, like, how do you spice up Guild War? Maybe make it so it's not as much of a specific point differential. Because uh, he mentions the top 100 guilds here, which I don't think this always applies to. But, like, in top 20, top 10 guild play, you quite often come down to, like, one, maybe two attacks. And that's the difference. And so you're taking the experience of 30 people and really minuscule details in terms of who wins or loses. And the question is, how would you feel if, let's say, top 100 guilds or whatever rank, were able to have up to 60 offensive teams and 60 defensive teams? And we already technically have, like, those sub-teams that right now that the, the system is kind of in place if they wanted that, two per player, and the maximum acquirable stars would increase from 90 to 80. Uh, you know, it's it's not it's not a the worst concept in terms of trying to solve maybe some problems here. Um I, I know what my initial reaction was. I'll let you kick this one off if you want, though. Um, my my initial reaction is that it just sounds like too much. Like it, it the when you're actually like competing in in the top end of the game, it's already a lot of work. Like in in my guild, does it? I mean, we, we don't even go as hard as you as a lot of you know the as at least as as hard as the top couple of guilds go. Um. But it's it's like a daily just for maintaining one one defense and one attack. It's it's a lot of work. I can't imagine doubling that. Um, so I'm not sure. I would hope that they could spice it up in different ways rather than just making it bigger and grander. Uh, we we've talked about a couple of, of of ways in the past where maybe your team becomes uh, four units or five units uh, instead of three, and then maybe you can open up some different synergies and maybe some different units could shine more in that setting. That could be interesting. Uh, we've talked about maybe having like a guild boss, like a raid boss, you know, designation for one member of the guild, maybe the leader, where maybe they have more stats or or maybe they have some other perks that can kind of make their team a little bit more difficult to take down, um, things like that. Uh, so I personally wouldn't wouldn't like it if they went that with this particular direction that he mentions. No, Sam, I think uh, would be catastrophically bad for everyone you're talking about literally double the amount of work where yeah. e even guilds outside of top 25 want to put in the bare minimum work uh, the amount of time they actually spend mocking and setting up teams is very minimal if at all the fact that all of a sudden you have to ask your entire guild to put out double the amount of teams i think would go very poorly um to to mock and make sure they're all the same and you know i see why he's going this way but the amount of work it would take is just uh way too much and I, I think that, that you're always going to have that situation because it is daily guild war and that's daily work that to, to maintain that stuff. If they decided to go away from that daily format and it was once a week or twice a week, maybe this grander type of setup could be more interesting. But in a day-to-day -day kind of thing, no, I, I don't want to mock another team <laughs> and, and deal with that. No, not at all. Not at all. And then this segues nicely. This is a follow-up question uh, from Spike that, you know, would you prefer if Guild War was not daily? And what would you prefer it to be? I'll answer quickly if you don't mind. Um, yeah. I think daily is totally fine. They need to expand the mock hours. That's literally all it is. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a daily Guild War. I think the problem comes down to the fact that the investment of time to make the Guild War work is that you're limited to the mocking hours of a certain period of the day. So it becomes very stressful that you have to get certain changes in before that amount of time to be able to mock certain things. That I think if they were to open that window, the daily stress wouldn't be as bad because you could get some of your guild war work done in a longer period of time. And so the burden would be however you want to manage your time over 24 hours, as opposed to like literally dedicating it toward like, let's say business hours when you need to be working in your job, or maybe it's too early for you because half your guild is in Asia and they're mocking at a time where you're not awake yet. That I think if they just expanded the mock window, I don't think daily guild war would be as daunting to complete because you'd have more flexibility to put in the work whenever you want to put it into. I'm kind of like halfway with you. So I would actually like it if it wasn't daily. I don't mind that it, that it is, but if it is going to be daily, I would like there to be more breaks built in, more breaks built into the schedule, whether that's like every maintenance, like every, you know, four times a month, if we're going to have four maintenances or whatever, um, you know, we already have that, but I think just make it regular, even if it's just a small patch, make that still a, a break day. Uh, maybe, and then maybe they could add it in another couple of days in the so that maybe instead of you know 30 guild wars a month 
we have 25. That that helps, you know, kind of uh, the overall fatigue of, of the mode. The other thing that I would absolutely absolutely like to see is guild raid weeks. Guild war is gone, and then everybody can just focus yes. on guild raids. I really, it, it feels like too much during those weeks where you're trying to maintain the guild war and still trying to actually compete and do something real in the guild raids. So it would be nice if they just switch to that they come around so rarely so that rare I, I don't, you know it's uh it wouldn't be a big deal to kind of take a week off there i love that suggestion because uh, my only counterpoint to having the extra break of a day is that we spend so much like time and resources and money on these units that guild war is really the only place you get to really use them uh arena is one thing but arena you're only using a couple units that week very rarely to get to use like whatever you want in arena i guess you could um free match Kind of same idea. If you want to get tokens, you really need to put up the best team you can. And so by removing a day of Guild War, you're kind of like removing a day in which you're actually able to use the units. There's really no PvE content on a regular basis that requires you to use them. So I, I don't know if I like that idea of, of losing out on the extra time to get the most out of the unit you put so much like work into, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. The last question here on the topic of Arena. Uh, what ways would you like to propose to spice up Arena, if any? This is from... Brad Strong Earth, who just ranked number one. Congrats on that. That is quite the achievement. I am super envious. <laughs> I, I mentioned him. I've, I've competed for number one, and I've come in second place five times. And I'm just so tired of staying up till three in the morning every time. I'm, I permanently have given up on that endeavor that um, <laughs> not worth it. But the uh, his proposal here is that to give an incentive to put out a good team that you would get points if people passively crash on your team. I have a thought on this. Do you want to go first or do you want me to answer? So one, th one thing that I'll throw in there is I do like his suggestion. I, I, I like the having some defense angle that, that you have to worry about. It could be kind of a, an interesting portion of it. Um, of course, they would have to add in a whole tracking system and then how do you actually gauge how it's working uh, and how well it's working if you can't actually see what they're doing or, you know, things like that. So that might be a kind of challenging part of it to kind of min max. But uh, one thing I'll throw in the ring is that I really, really liked that limited guild war or I'm sorry, limited arena that they did. You know, I think it was like a month or two or two, you know, maybe two months ago. Um, I hope that that's not the last that we see of that. I would like to see that be a recurring thing, maybe every couple of months. Uh, where we just have that week where I, I I really did enjoy having just a set amount of times that I could play the arena and really trying to maximize, you know, the potential of each, you know, use of my my arena for the day. Uh, I thought that that made the mode much, much more interesting for me because at least right now it's very much just make a random team and skip it. And, you know, it, you know I know the team's going to win and, you know, there's not big stakes there other than trying to get the weekly viz. So... Uh, that that week felt much different to me in, in trying to compete there. I agree with you. And for his suggestion, I think for 99% of people, that's actually a really good suggestion. I don't like it, though, for the only reason of those actually competing in top 10. One of the big things that when you get to, let's say, the final night and you're in that top three position. Not, now, I'm sure most viewers haven't actually been in this position when you're at this final stroke of 3 a.m. trying to beat that number one person to accumulate the points. The thing is, if you if you lose to that person, that means they're beating you. So as you're both fighting against each other in that final hour, that means that person is able to already get the point advantage over you because you're not able to catch up to them on points because by losing, you don't get nearly as many points compared to them at winning, getting more points. So like, in, I don't know if I said that right, but the idea basically being like, if you have a better team already, that's already stumping people, you're already getting kind of a point advantage over them by the fact that you should be getting equal to, if not more points. The multiplier has an effect on that in terms of the calculation, but the fact that this would further accelerate that gap, I don't know if I love that from a very top end, just because I've been there and I know what it's like, that if someone's already got a team you can't beat, um, they're already getting the point advantage on you. The stump doesn't actually, I think, change anything. So that's my only concern is is that scenario, which again is like one percent doesn't affect most people. But uh, I like I like the mode that you suggested as a better alternative. I think the scoring is is just fine. I think the other thing that that um, they they would need to fundamentally change how the mode works in terms of 
Like right now, I can completely view the team, including straight down to their stats, which which cards and equipment they're using, what their trust stones are, what their trust stone passives, everything. I, I can. It's an open book in terms of you know. So it's very very rare that that I'll lose in in arena unless something just um, unexpected happens, like with some turn orders or you know maybe I'm just going up against a team that I don't have an answer for. Of course, that can happen. But, you know, assuming I am using a suitable counter, it's just not happening that, that I'm going to lose in that mode, you know, like I said, unless something strange happens. So I think they would need to go to a blind setup in Arena where you can just see the you can just see the first slot unit. Maybe you can see some basic stats. Being able to see the full team setup, I think, um, I don't, I'm not sure how much defense points you're going to be getting in that in that scenario. Right. No, I agree. And the only time it would occur is in the top 10 to your point if you had a team you didn't have an answer for um but again that's a very niche population of the, the arena i wouldn't change the whole arena just to like enhance that segment of it yeah but uh but yeah but that's the that's the q a that's everything we wanted to cover again there's a lot of stuff to really catch up on there's more that we obviously wanted to go in depth in but we'll have a lot more to talk about this week i'm sure uh just with the timing of things but i don't know anything else we want to talk about last minute here that, th- that cover everything. I don't think so. I think it's a good way to start 2024. Uh, hopefully everybody had t- time off for the holidays. And hopefully, you know, if you're in kind of a cold weather area, like like uh, Will and I are, hopefully you're, you're staying warm. And uh, I'm happy to, to get back to this. And uh, certainly more to come here in, in, uh, in the coming weeks. Yeah, definitely so. I'm really appreciating the state of the game currently. I know it seems very stale with Helen and Vivi, but I think they've still done a good job introducing units that, have a fighting chance i think there's some variety in the types of units and teams and uh i do appreciate this guild war map is a little bit different in that it's a little bit longer range so i I applaud gumi for still like keeping the game feeling fresh even though it might feel stale at times i think it's changed often enough on like a month-to-month basis that i'm still having a lot of fun theory crafting and like trying to beat the meta because it's certainly beatable we we do it frequently uh you know we we did uh showcase about helena in particular a couple weeks ago maybe we'll see if we can do one about helena vivi but uh but who knows even by next week that might even start to fade because i know right now in, in the top end of the game there's still a lot of counterplay for it so we'll see what we can pull out for you but that's it for now thanks for watching per usual everybody and we'll see you soon have a good night good night